For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Good morning, Covenant. It's good to see everyone this morning. I know we have uh, a horde of people over in the fellowship hall as the children are having their carnival and a great time over there. And thank you to all the volunteers that are helping pull that off. Uh, this morning, it couldn't happen without a host of very energetic volunteers who are with all those energetic children this morning. Uh, you know, uh, back around Labor Day, I started a project that was long overdue. Uh, it was organizing my garage. Boy, is that ever a pain. And uh, <laughs> cleaning stuff out that needed to be cleaned out, uh, really organizing fishing gear that I had been accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. And uh, my wife, it was getting on her nerves. And uh, so I started doing all that. And one of the things I realized is that on one of the shelves, I had uh, two Christmases worth of gifts that had not been opened because they were just pretty much useless. And uh, they were well-intentioned Christmas gifts from my, uh, my boys, uh, but I had never opened them. And so I took them uh, back uh, to Disney World for Men, um, uh, also known as Bass Pro Shop, and uh, I turned them back in. Uh, and it was really kind of an experiment because my one son, the skeptical one, said, oh, they're never going to take that back. It's been too long. And, uh, but they did. They took back two Christmases worth of, of stuff that I couldn't use, and I got a store credit. And uh, I walked out with something that I had been keeping my eye on for a long, long time. I had been lusting after, uh, excuse me, I had been desiring this, uh, this eight-foot uh, and a very nice fishing rod. And as you can tell on the way out, I had to take a picture of it and then I had to text it to a bunch of fishing buddies, which meant I immediately got, you know, em emojis of thumbs up and hands clapping and all that. And I took it home and I was excited because I had on my shelf a Finnor 6000 reel, which means nothing to most of you, but it had been sitting there waiting for a new rod. And I was pairing this up specifically for the mullet run so that I could get out. And I put it together. I had it spooled, got my leaves, everything good to go now for the mullet run so I can get out and hopefully catch some tarpon. And of course, uh, the wind and red tide has really stopped that from happening. So, but it doesn't matter because I walk out. It's just something about it. I walk out into the garage. I did it the other night and I glanced up at my, my fishing rack and I just went, ah, yes. You know, what is it about new stuff, right? You get something new and it, it just kind of brings that, you know, response uh, out of us. Why is it that we love new so much? I mean, we do love it. I mean, let's face it, they, the, the marketers, I mean, they even have new car smell for us, right? When we go to get our car clean, you know, did you want new car smell? They know that we like new. Why do we like new so much? Um, assuming that it's not because of, you know, crass materialism or, you know, some other kind of petty motive, uh, we like, I would contend that we like new because it's addressing something that is old. It's addressing something that isn't right in our world. You know, that's maybe it's something that is broken or it's something that is lacking. It is something that's, you know, worn out. You know, you ladies, you bought that house and when you bought it, your husband promised that, that flooring that you didn't like, that y'all would replace it. And then 10 years later, it's still there. And finally, finally, you got that new flooring and it just, ah, you know, it just gives you, finally, you know? I mean, some of you, uh, because of your stage in life, you have come into church with big grins uh, through the years, and I've said, why, why? you look awfully happy. He goes, yes, I got a new knee, you know, <laughs> you know or a new hip, and, and you know, all that pain is gone. Uh, or I think most of us have experienced you know, a car that we have milked every single mile out of that thing that we can milk, 
and it begins to just break down and break down and uh, repairs mount up and finally we just say enough is enough and we go and we get a new car or at least a new to us type of car uh, and it's more reliable and it just kind of finally I'm done with that thing that it's been such a pain. Uh, we love new and the reason why I think we love new is that it is ripe with potential. It is, uh, it is overflowing with promise. And if you're wondering, okay, well, what does that have to do with our mission statement? Because we're in the middle of a series that is kind of delving and diving into our mission statement. Well, our mission statement, bringing gospel restoration to people's deepest needs and our broken world, really taps in to this overflowing promise and potential that is contained in this word of new. Because with, with gospel restoration, Jesus is giving to us and to our world the very best kind of new. Now, last week we looked at the word bringing. The fact that because, you know, we have experienced that love of Christ being poured out in our life, and he's died for us and uh, rose from the dead, and we now belong to him, and we live for him, but we're, we're his ambassadors, we bring, either bring the gospel to people, or we bring people into the gospel community as his ambassadors. That's bringing. But what are we bringing? We're bringing gospel restoration. And so this morning, we're going to part on these two words, this portion of our mission statement, gospel restoration. And from our passage here in 1 Corinthians 5, last week, we were in verses 14 and 15 for bringing, and this week, we're going to really part on verses 16 and 17 with gospel restoration. And we're going to, I want you to see really three applications out of these verses that'll help us better understand what exactly it is that we're bringing, this new that Jesus gives us, this best kind of new that is wrapped up in gospel restoration. Before we do that, though, let's, let's make sure that we're kind of working with the same understanding, singing off the same sheet of music, so to speak. You know, let's don't assume that we are uh, defining words the same way. When I say gospel or I say restoration, so for example, restoration, you know, that, that word restoration speaks to the fact that things are, are disintegrating and they're broken and they need to be made whole. They need to be healed, either in our life or in other people's lives or in our world. These, the, the brokenness, the devastation that we see, it's the result of sin, isn't it? It's the result of the fall. And let's understand that what needs to be restored is broken. And as we just saw, saw a few moments ago, addictions and different things that are happening in our world and in our lives are there because of sin and the fall. You know, the team that worked on this visioning, we came up with all kinds of words, you know. There's gospel celebration and gospel centeredness and gospel life and gospel joy and gospel unity. And all of those things are wonderful things to desire and experience. But understand something, that until the devastation of sin is addressed, those fruits of the gospel will never be experienced in our lives or in our world. So this word restoration is an important word. The word gospel is important. What does that word gospel mean? Again, we talked about a lot of different words. Why not Christ? Bringing Christ to people's deepest needs. Well, well that word Christ or bringing the cross, well, that word gospel is an all-encompassing word that describes the person, the work, the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, this is Reformation Sunday, right? Uh, around the world, Reformed churches like ours celebrate the Reformation in different ways, and the Reformation had at its heart what are known as the five solas, right? Sola Scriptura, only Scripture. That's what we rest upon, and Sola fide, faith alone, is, and grace alone. Sola gratia is, is how we come to salvation. And sola dea gloria, for the glory of God alone. There's another sola, it's, it's sola Christus, Christ alone. Christ alone. 
Let's understand something, church. Let's make no mistake about what the cure is to what ails our world. It is Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Let's understand, church, that with the gospel, we are bringing Christ. We are bringing God himself. We are bringing the power of God into the situation that needs to be addressed. Whatever the brokenness is, whatever the devastation is, when we bring the gospel to bear in that situation, it can be a Christian home that is devastated by sin and the marriage is in danger. It can be a lost person who is seeking answers to life's biggest questions. It can be any number of hundreds of different scenarios, but when we bring Jesus Christ, when we bring the gospel into that situation, we are bringing the power of God into that situation, and that's the only hope. The only hope. This is why the apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. It's the foolishness of the gospel that God uses to change and address the brokenness that's in our world and restore people. So these are foundational principles that we have to understand if we're going to understand our mission statement. There's another foundational principle that I just want to give us before we dig into the passage, and and that's this about gospel restoration. Let's also understand, we can take a deep breath here and kind of relax, church, because gospel restoration is what God does. We don't do gospel restoration. Gospel restoration is what God does through Christ. And he, he uses us to bring to other people something that we ourselves are experiencing. That's what's cool about it. God is the one who does gospel restoration through Christ, but he uses people who are experiencing gospel restoration to bring it to people who need it. Isn't that cool? And that's the point of verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All of us who are experiencing the the benefits of the gospel and are being restored by the gospel can be used by God to bring it to those who need it. So we're saying all that, just kind of laying, I just wanted to lay that groundwork so that we are kind of operating on the same page. Let's dig into the text. Let's see this gospel restoration that Jesus gives and why it is the best kind of new that there is. There's three applications I want us to see this morning. Beginning in verse 16, first of all, with gospel restoration, Jesus gives us a new perspective on people and on our world. Look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, and these opening words are are pointing us back to the truth of verses 14 and 15. Therefore, in other words, because Jesus has shed his love out in our lives and he's, he's changed us, he's redeemed us, he now motivates us, and he owns us, he uses us, we serve him as his ambassadors. Because of this, this is our reality now as followers of Christ. Notice what he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though 
we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What's he saying? What's Paul saying? That, especially that last sentence. That's a little confusing when he starts talking about we once regarded Christ, and now we don't. What's he talking about? He's, he's pointing out the reality of his own testimony. Remember the story of the apostle Paul. His name wasn't always Paul. It was started out as Saul, and, and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a rabbi training under the famous rabbi teacher Gamaliel. Uh, he was well acquainted with Jesus and the teaching of Jesus and, and the, the, the followers of Jesus. And we're introduced to him first in the book of Acts. He is not a believer. He is a persecutor of the church. And, and he is devastating the church. The church Christians are scared of Saul because he has the authority of the Sanhedrin and he's going from city to city and he's arresting Christians, and they're being tortured, and they're even being killed. He hates Christianity. He hates Jesus Christ. When he looks at Jesus Christ in the flesh as a human being, all he sees is a fake, a fraud, a pretender. Someone who claimed to be the Messiah, but it was impossible for him to be the Messiah because cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And so here is this deluded man who has deceived all these people who are now worshiping and saying he's the Messiah. There's a bunch of bunk, and he hates the followers of Christ, and he hates Christ, and he persecutes them. This is his perspective, and his worldview was such that he is a Jew, and the Jews are the chosen people. The Gentiles are dogs. Christians are dogs. They're worthy of contempt. They're worthy of persecution until he's on the road to Damascus. And on that road to Damascus, Jesus comes to him in a very clear vision. And in a moment of time, in an instant, Jesus pours out his love into the heart of that man, Saul, and he is gloriously converted. And his perspective is immediately changed as to who Jesus is and even who Christians are and Gentiles. And here this man, who had hated Christians, who had hated Gentiles, becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, gospel restoration changed his complete perspective on Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ, and people in general. Really what he's doing here is he's, he's making a kind of a subtle point to these Corinthians. The Corinthians, remember, they were rejecting Paul's authority. They were looking at Paul and they were saying, you know, who are you to tell us what we should be doing in our church? I mean, we know that you came and started our church, but I mean, you don't have the, the looks. You don't have the rhetoric ability and the preaching ability like Apollos does. I mean, you're kind of short, you're dumpy, you're ugly, you don't dress well. You, you apparently aren't, a, you know, a prestigious enough apostle to be able to make a living from it. You go over here and you make tents, and you'd starve to death if you didn't have a second job. So why exactly should we be listening? See, they were judging Paul by the criteria of their culture as to what made someone successful, worthy of being listened to. Maybe if they were here today and they were looking at the man of God, they would say, well, you know, what's your, what's your educational pedigree? Where'd you go to college? Where'd you go to seminary? You know, why do you, you got to dress a certain way, talk a certain way, look a certain way, act a certain way. You know, what kind of house, what kind of car do you drive? Uh, you know, don't we do this to people? I mean, look at the criteria of our culture. You know, look at social media. I mean, how many followers do you have? I mean, it seems nowadays that you're nothing if you don't have a certain number of followers or your last name is Kardashian, right? I mean, the criteria of our culture as to what makes someone important or significant, it's all externals, isn't it? Or in this time of the year, it's are you red or blue? It's, you know, who do we value? And who do we look up to? And who do we hang out with? And who do we want to be around? Are you Republican or Democrat? Or for others, it's, are you, what, what color is your skin? 
Are you conservative or liberal? Are you a Christian or not Christian? You know, and then what kind of Christian are you? I mean, we, we have so many criteria that we evaluate people by, it seems like, today. And as a result, we are a fractured society, and churches even become fractured. And Paul is saying, wait a second, with gospel restoration, Jesus gives us a completely new perspective on people and our world. In a sense, with gospel restoration comes a form of gospel disregard. We disregard people based upon the criteria of the externals and the culture. We don't regard. We have a disregard when it comes to what the world says makes someone valuable and worthy. If we go by the world's standards, even by maybe sometimes Christianity's standards or popular Christianity, you don't invest in certain kinds of people. Why waste your time? That's not God's standard. You see, man looks at the outward appearance, but God, he looks where? At the heart. Man looks at people from a, humanity looks at people from an external, fleshly perspective. But when we experience the gospel, we are being called to look at people through spiritual eyes, with eyes that have discernment. Eyes that can say, this person may look well put together, but the reality is, they're a shipwreck. How many times have you seen perhaps a couple that gets divorced and you say to yourself, wow, I had no idea they were having problems. You ever said that to yourself? Why? Because everything on the outside looks great. But the truth is radically different. Folks, the truth of our world is that we have become masters at presenting image that is false. And we do it in our churches, and we do it in our world. But gospel restoration says no. Look at things the way God sees it. This is a struggle. It's hard. I mean, this is a struggle for God's people. The Corinthians were doing it to Paul. In the book of James, you see James warning this church. They were looking at people based upon their economic success, whether they were rich or poor, and they were given preferential treatment to those who were more financially well-off. And James warns them, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Isn't that interesting? He says this very fact right here that we show partiality to people and we judge people by external factors makes us guilty of violating all of God's law and standing before him condemned in need of a savior. Just this one area. The, these Christians, they loved the rich and they put them before others. Hey, do you have a criteria? It's hard for us to see it. We kind of are blind to it. But do you see, perhaps, do, do we tend to maybe hang around the same kinds of people all the time? Do we socialize on Facebook or in other places with always the same people who have the same opinions, the same mindset, they look, talk, act, everything just like we do. We're, we have three, two, one that we're praying for, and we're having a hard time praying for three people that are in my life who are lost. There's your sign. There's your sign, church. If we're struggling with having three people in Brevard County who are lost that are in our lives, there's a sign that perhaps we're looking at people through a criteria that needs to change. It needs to change. The old criteria, fleshly criteria has to die. Paul says, God, with gospel restoration, we will begin to see people the way Jesus calls us to see them. And how does he call us to see them? 
He calls us to see that he died for all people, all kinds of people across the spectrum of humanity. Jesus died for them. We cannot sideline anyone. People with tattoos, people in the gutter, people in the mansion, people with advanced degrees, people with no education, people who are rich, poor, and everything in between, people with nice cars, lousy cars, people who are just cantankerous, mean cusses, and people who are polite southern bells. You name it, Jesus died for all of them. And he calls for us to be ambassadors to all people. With gospel restoration, not only does Jesus give us a new worldview and perspective on people, secondly, and this is neat, he gives us a new nature and identity. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Paul, in describing this new that Jesus is doing in our lives through the gospel, he reaches all the way back to the book of Genesis. He pulls from the power of creation, what, what God is doing in the opening pages of the Bible to describe what he's doing in our lives. He began this in chapter 4. In chapter 4, he says to the Corinthians in verse 6, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what he's getting at here? He's saying, hey, Christian, this is what's happening to you. This is the type of new that Jesus is bringing into your life. Jesus, this person who created order out of chaos, who brought light out of darkness, he's using that same power to recreate and restore your broken, devastated life. And in doing this, this power of God that, that he's unleashing in your life, what he's doing is he's giving us a new nature, a new identity. And with this being the way it is, Things cannot stay the way they were. We have to understand things are now changed. We have to live differently and see our life differently because we have been made radically different through this power of God in our life. To the Colossians, he describes it this way. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, and again, here's where those, this new worldview, this new perspective, all the old criteria go away. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ. That's all there is, but Christ is all and in all. This is who we are now. We are in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation in Christ. Boy, we, we could go weeks on that little phrase right there. There's so much. That phrase is pregnant with meaning and application. But where is he going with this? In other words, we get our life, we get our motivation, we get our words, we get our thoughts, we get our worldview, we get our power, we get our encouragement, we get our motivation from one person, Jesus Christ. How does it happen? I gave you this verse a few weeks back. I am the vine, he says. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. With this kind of new, Jesus begins to change us and to live his life through us. That ought to blow our minds. That ought to just, just mystify us. 
that the creator of the universe says, I'm going to begin to live my life through you. And I'm going to continue my work through you. And as a result, this new nature, this new life of being in Christ, we're no longer opposed to God. We're no longer resisting His will and His law and His plan. Instead, we delight in it. This is the result of the change that has worked in our lives because we're a new creation who's in Christ. Hey, can I ask you this morning, is this your testimony? Is this the trajectory of your life that you delight in the plan and the will and the law and the heart of God himself? You know, it happens at different rates of speed. But this is the story, this is the storyline of everybody who is a follower of Jesus Christ. This is the trajectory of every one of our lives. This verse describes every one of us if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And if this is not describing the trajectory of your life, if you do not see in your life this love of God and His will and His plan and His law, and if it doesn't delight you to live for Christ and I see Him living through you, if that doesn't energize you and encourage you and delight your heart and fill you with joy, it's because... You've never experienced this redeeming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're deluding yourself. You're involved in religion and not a relationship with the creator of the universe and the Lord who died on the cross for us. Hear that this morning, church. This verse has to be it has to be the testimony of all of our lives if anyone is in christ he is a new creation with gospel restoration jesus gives us a new perspective on people and on our world he gives us a new worldview he gives us a new nature and a new identity and finally in verse 17 at the very end of this passage of this verse Jesus gives us a new freedom and a new destiny. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now notice what he says. The old has passed away. Behold! It's a word of excitement. Behold! The new has come. You know, Paul is, in this whole verse, he's been reaching back to the Old Testament. With creation, he's reaching back to Genesis. And even when this part... He's reaching back to a, a thread that runs through the entire Old Testament, a promise that is here. In Exodus, it appears when Moses says, there's going to come one who will be greater than me. And, and you know, here he is. He's, he's leading the people out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And Moses says, there's coming someone who is going to lead you into a greater Exodus than the one that I'm leading you. And then when he fasts forward into the prophets, when, when Jerusalem is taken into captivity and they're put into uh, exile, they are promised a day will come that you will be restored back to Jerusalem and to the promised land and the city and the temple will be rebuilt. But guess what? There's coming a day, the prophet says, when an even greater restoration is going to come. In Isaiah chapter 43, for example, God says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, there it is again, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And he's pointing to the fact that one day he's going to restore it all. And his kingdom will come. And the Israelites, they read this and they yearned for it. And then Jesus comes in Mark, for example. 
And he begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom. God has now broken forth into this plain, and he's establishing his kingdom. Oh, great! The restoration has been promised. It's here. But they didn't understand. You know, it's just gotten inaugurated. It's not going to be fulfilled yet. And then there's this passage in the book of Romans. I love this. In Romans chapter 8, and here's this whole idea about how the new has come and this promise that is in this word new, this destiny, this freedom that we have and the role that we play. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says this to us. He says, understand, Christian, because you're now in Christ, you've been, you've been adopted into the family of God. You can cry out, Abba, Father, you belong to the heavenly Father. He's your dad. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Do you know what this means? This means that in all of creation, you are the down payment for the restoration of all of the universe. You are, you and me, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are God making a down payment on this promise that he made in Isaiah chapter 43. And so all of the universe and all of fallen creation that is suffering from death and from the effects of sin, it says in Romans 8, they look at us and they go, yes, yes. Our restoration is right around the corner because look at these men and women who have been given this new identity in Jesus Christ. When Jesus gives us gospel restoration, he gives us the very best kind of new there is. And as he says at the end of the passage, the book of Revelation, behold, I am making all things new. This storyline runs through the Bible. We love new. We yearn for new. And sometimes our yearning for new, it, it may be because of crass materialism and wrong motives. But brothers and sisters, we also yearn for new. Because we know this world is not right. It is broken. And it is devastated. And it is disintegrating because of sin. And so we should love new. Because when we get that new, whatever it may be, in its right form, it's just a little taste of what our Lord is actually up to. He's making it all new. And you and I were the down payment on that new. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for doing this work, this new work in our lives. We don't deserve it, as you point out in 2 Timothy, before the world even began, you, you called us out and you created this plan to restore us to redeem us, to conform us to the image of your glory so that we could know immortality and experience the grace that only you can give. We thank you for the new that you're doing in our lives. And Lord Jesus, I would ask that if there's one here this morning who this story is not their story at this point in time, that you would remove the blinders, that you would give them a heart that yearns for you, Lord Jesus, that you would shed your love out upon them in such a way that they would be drawn irresistibly to you, and that they would see that truly you are the one who can make all things new, that you can restore and rebuild the most broken and give eternal life. For your glory, I ask these things. Amen.